everybody likes my tests. Damn it! Can't tell her what to do. She's an independent woman. Independent woman. Independent woman. Hey, yeah. Ooh. Okay, we're riffing. Was that you? Who was that? Heard a noise. Skyrim. I have watched the Loki season two finale and I loved it. I thought it was visually stunning. I thought that it was, of course, CG heavy, but really, really, really good looking. Reminded me of the visuals from the 90s film, What Dreams May Come. Very sort of almost hand-painted cool disco lights and stuff. I loved it. I love the fact that, you know, most of my predictions came true. I do have some mixed feelings. I am overall conflicted over the finale of Loki. I actually wrote this script, which is a weird tense thing I'm going over in my mind right now. I'm reading a script that I'm talking about having written early in the morning in past tense and then saying that I will be seeing the Marvels today. I'm sorry, that's confusing to me. So as of this recording, I have seen both the season finale for Loki season two and the Marvels as well. I would like to share some thoughts I have about each, if I may. So the episode itself, as I said, was stunning. It's a great encapsulation of the Loki story about this particular Loki that we've come to know and love. It's a good ending. It left a few decent strings that can lead to other projects that the TVA could be involved in. It didn't necessarily rule Loki out as having uh, the possibility of being in other projects, but it did kind of give a good sort of final send off to this particular character. The problem is kind of that I ended up shaking my head a little bit in a mixture of both awe and disbelief, but also just a little tiny bit of disappointment. And I think that it's, it's clear to me, you know, clearly because I'm making a video on this, that people who are passionate enough about something to make videos on it would set expectations pretty high for projects that they love. And upon introspection, uh, might I just add that maybe we add a little bit too much and maybe not. But I think that there's a good opportunity here to talk about a couple of things that I feel like are sending Marvel in directions other than cohesive, consistent, and thoroughly entertained. And not to say that there are any projects that I've seen recently from Marvel, which I'm gonna get into that I necessarily disliked. I just think that there are some opportunities here to consider some different points of view in the hopes that maybe we can get a little bit of public discourse going on to just bring a little bit of awareness to these issues. That's my only hope here. So join me, won't you, as I lift my mug of water. First, I think I want to point out something that a lot of people probably already know. I think the problem with a lot of the early Marvel movies is that most people weren't really ready for superheroes yet. We didn't have a huge YouTube online presence for people making reaction content. We didn't even have reaction content. So if you've, if, if y'all have ever read a comic book, there's all kinds of shit that you never see in the movies in the past because they couldn't actually make anything happen because of ratings or because of satanic panic or because uh, special effects technology wasn't that far developed. In the days of Frigno's Hulk, I don't think anyone ever thought that they would see anything close to Loki's finale's visuals, right? Or incursions on screen for that matter. This is the reason why Galactus in the Fantastic Four sequel with Steve Rogers was a cloud, you know? There's no way having a planet-sized man would have worked back then. As a stark contrast, the comics cover everything from identity politics societal issues, civil rights, and span entire multiverses in single hero's journeys. If anything, the most accurate comic book television show or film these days would be The Boys because it actually covers modern societal issues. They almost always end in cliffhangers as well. I understand that in film and in Hollywood, it's the people and it's their stories that matter, so the arcs have to get completed or else audiences will feel kind of blue balled, you know? The reason companies want to appeal to not just comic book nerds is because movies cost exorbitant amounts of money and the wider appeal of your product or service, the better your sales will be. I get that and I understand that. But here's my problem. It seemed like for years and years before we ever got the MCU, we had different Marvel projects and some of them were successes and some of them were failures and they all were very loosely, if at all, connected. The MCU brought a cohesive plan to the preceding movies but didn't really give the previous movies much credit for being what they were. 
It just kind of was sort of what we are expecting the MCU to do in the near future, which is sort of a hard reboot of everything that we had seen so far, kind of discounting it. So I think before the MCU hit its stride, we went too big. We saw that it was too comic book too fast for people to adjust to the style and scope of these films. Look at Sin City, for example. But times have changed. And this speaks to a larger issue of corporate reiteration and maintenance, where it's widely believed that you should go back to basics every once in a while to refine and strengthen the roots that built your business in the first place. For Marvel, the impetus would be the success of the MCU proper to sustainability. In other words, once it's able to stand on its own, once the movies can make money, then you can start going crazy. Then you can start blowing people's minds with all the accurate comic book stuff. This would have happened probably around Guardians of the Galaxy or Captain America Winter Soldier when we went hard with the team-ups and ensembles. Even the first Avengers film felt like a test or a pilot for something. As soon as we, and by that I mean the MCU, got comfy in its shoes, we should have started going balls to the wall, insane, multiverse spanning, crazy disco adventures, and started leaving the minutiae to the side. At this point, we could have brought in a lot of the same people who work in the comics and serialization, who are the fucking masters at developing story in small little bits, using visuals to tell the bulk of it. I understand that it's hard to make that happen in a film setting, but we need that if we want to avoid telling the same boring story of loss and being orphaned and fighting the same guy as you, who's just a mirror of you without the people or connections in your life that keep you grounded, so oh, you better stay decent or you turn out like this guy, kind of thing. Just as an aside, just to give a, a small idea of how wacky things can get. In the fall of X storyline happening currently, Mr. Sinister, a mutant from the old English Sherlock Holmes days, spent all the time since then as an X-Man villain, usually with the goal of cloning Jean Grey so he could have the most powerful telepathic in his pocket. I forget how this works out, but it's because he wants to control her kids because they would be insanely powerful. So he fools Scott, Cyclops, her husband, who she's in a love triangle with with Logan, into sleeping with her clone, which creates Nate Grey, who is Cable, who is a time-traveling soldier. Mr. Sinister, after decades of his shenanigans, has been revealed to have made several clones of himself who all have enacted secret plans to destroy the X-Men. By the way, at this point in modern day in comics, the X-Men are a sovereign people who are in charge of their own living island nation whose entrances and exits are only accessible through portals it can create on a whim and only by mutants. The X-Men also encompasses all mutants, including villains. Oh, and they can all resurrect at any time. Sinister had been being a bastard, so they dropped him into a bottomless pit, so his clones put their plans into action, destabilizing the X-Men turning public opinion against them again, developing new Sentinels from Iron Man suit that had been legitimately bought when Stark lost controlling shares in his company and gathering the remains of Hydra, AIM, and other villainous organizations, including enlisting MODOK to attack the X-Men at their Hellfire Gala, an event put on by the PR firm of mutants to showcase the drug the mutants develop that is the primary source of the nation's commerce that help humanity with a lot of previously unsolvable problems like Al Alzheimer's and even aging, where the intention is to let the world know that the X-Men are harmless, pretty much ruining any chances they had left to appeal to humanity. When this happened, the Eternals struck a deal with Moira Taggart, two parties with their own crazy in-depth stories, and together murdered millions of mutants and destroyed the other mutant nation of Arako on Mars by unleashing the oldest Eternal Uranus, who within one hour reduced every mutant there was to bone and ash. Millions dead, Charles was held at the threat of every mutant's death, and forced to telepathically compel every remaining mutant mutant still millions to walk through the Krakoa portals and off Earth proper. He didn't know at the time that the portals endpoints were basically the void at the end of time, but a different worse void with angry clones of Wolverine that come up from the sand to shred passers-by like a goddamn antlion. So he thinks the portals lead to a blender dimension because he loses contacts with the mutants and ends up doing a hermit penance thing on the beach, killing anyone who walks onto the island. Kitty Pride starts killing people in brutal ways and becomes an assassin. Juggernaut's a good guy. Cyclops gets his eyes sewn shut. Like... <sighs> I think my problem with all of this is that we set movies and TV series up in a way that actually throws a wrench into, into their ability to build a long-lasting universe. Think of it. If you're paying $15 million an episode to make a show, and Robert Downey Jr. costs $10 million for a short cameo, you can't have him show up in literally anything. How is Ironheart gonna be without RDJ in some capacity? Thor, Hemsworth, being in stuff costs a lot. ScarJo, Ruffalo, Rudd. Michael Douglas, there's no way you're ever bringing these characters back in on anything short of a big budget film. Which, there's your first problem. Gunn over at the DCU is reformatting all of his main characters with younger, lesser known actors 
and building the universe around them. I would even go one step deeper and have no-name actors play the heroes and switch them out as needed. If the MCU wants to make connected projects with shared universes and world and such, it needs to dump most of its budget into visual effects and technical capacity as well as fight choreography and distilling the exposition and texts. This can't happen if you're spending 80% of the budget on actors just to bring in the name recognition crowd. If anything, Celebrity could be what's killing the MCU. The other problem, which is a bit smaller, so I'll try to get through it more quickly, is that there are a lot of voices being heard and incorporated into each project. Like, look how enthusiastic everyone involved is in these projects. From directors to actors, even to hairstylists, set designers. Everyone these days loves comics and movies, and what do nerds have in spades? Opinions. Right? Everyone who's passionate about something has a vision of how they would personally do it, and this would absolutely influence decisions that they make in the course of doing these jobs. The problem, however, is that it's now a little too compartmentalized and that the vision isn't all over unified. Now the hairstylist has a vision for how Cap's hair should look, and they do it one way, and the next guy wants to change it up a bit, and then the next guy, and then the producer, and then the director, and then the shareholders, and then test audiences, and then studio execs. There are just so many opinions between the source material and the finished project, and it's often as a result very watered down. Only a mere shadow of what it could be. Know why the early X-Men movies were so good? Because studios didn't get involved because they didn't think they would succeed. Why was Wolverine Origins so bad? Studio involvement. The comics have small teams that handle each book, so it's a more unified vision, and it's mostly untampered with. Ultimately better in some cases. Anywho, in the finale episode, I was able to verify that there was indeed a Groundhog Day situation. He Who Remains was indeed in control or behind everything. And Loki did end up having to take control of the multiverse. It was great. It was very great. I only worry that this is a little final for Loki. And if we ever see him again, it might be a little short or it might not be Tom Hiddleston or it might end up being like a, a Bran Star three-eyed raven thing, which kind of makes me a little sad for the character in that his glorious purpose was more or less to sacrifice himself to protect the people he cares about, which, you know, again, with the MCU loss and sacrifice trope, it's done very well here, though. We can tell all of this because if you listen closely, the score that plays while he's ascending onto his throne is actually the same score that we hear in, I believe it's Dark World and possibly infinity war when he dies sacrificing himself or being heroic or something like that. It's that same sort of as guardian whale that you hear. So clearly the message here is Loki is truly now and forever a hero. We didn't end up seeing the god quarry or the white space, but this does still enforce what I said about the sort of crashing wave of Ouroboroses and the cascade effect sort of leading to the breaking of the cycle. Contrary to my prediction though, Renslayer was not in fact the crux of the episode, but will probably be if Kang Dynasty ever happens, since she's clearly going to get saved from or tame Eliath and meet Ramatut, judging by a ship in the distance, and the pyramid could even be the base for the Council of Kangs. We never saw the outside of it in Quantumania, and a pyramid is a good choice thematically, so the void is outside of time, could be outside of Loki's vision, possibly a TVA connection with the camera lingering on the motto during the scene with Renslayer. I don't know. Could also give us an excuse to bring back the Loki variants. Hey, why not, you know, have uh, Kang's Dynasty, the final battle, could take place in the void with all the Lokis helping. Could be cool. If they decide to bring God Loki back in again, the goal could be to kill him or use his power in some way. Maybe he could create the multiverse Avengers still, base them in the void. Or you could have Doom or Kang or whoever help him create Battle World. But we do see what looks like the void in Deadpool 3 in the set photos, so who knows. Anyway, to close the Loki chapter, it's a great episode. And it was visually and narratively stunning. Both bittersweet and purposeful. I think it's a good end to a chapter, all in all. Now on to the Marvels. It was actually surprisingly good. The Marvels was an overall decent and fun ride through the MCU and a satisfying return to the same formulaic stuff we see in other similar secondary entries. I know that it's common for people to want the second one to always be the best, but they never are. They always try to, to do something a little bit more wacky than the first one, and this one is no different in the uh, incursions and the flurkins and whatnot. Iron Man 2 at the time wasn't super loved either, but I always describe it as a fun ride. Nowadays, you can rarely see a YouTube video mentioning it without claiming it was one of the better movies in the MCU, which bandwagon jumpers, but hey, that's fine. Either way, it was predictable, it's basic, and it's Marvel in all its glory, which might not ring as well for some people. I think a lot of viewers have gotten used to these huge 
huge explosion filled three hour cinematic journeys into realms unknown for entire teams of people and to me personally it makes you a little overwhelmed sometimes with the huge scale of these movies. This feels more like 2008 and it's about time we got an entry that manages to stay in space most of the time but still give us a down to earth experience. We stay intimately close to the three main protagonists the entire movie with very little B plot shenanigans that have prevailed lately through the MCU, keeping the story short and sweet and keeping the spotlight on the heroes we actually came here to see, which is something you don't see often these days. There aren't really any exceptionally crazy moments that we've never seen in the MCU before except for the tearing between universes and that's a-okay. I like to see this return to form since very soon we're going to be getting wacky again with the likes of Fantastic Four and Secret Wars and stuff. To keep this mention of the Marvels short and sweet like the movie itself, it did have some threads that will take things into of the overall MCU's phases, like the almost incursion, which it seems like Marvel's actually afraid to show for some reason. Let's see some universes get all blown up and stuff, right? But we also got Beast and Binary and mention of Charles, so it's clearly not the 838 from Multiverse of Madness but probably another more ultimate-like universe where Charles is still alive. I also don't know why Kamala would only keep one bangle as it looked like she was only wearing one by the end which seems weird, correct me if I'm wrong. I'd have assumed she would lose both and just rely on her mutant powers or something, but hey. I also like the little Easter egg to Spectrum's costume, uh, the little fins that she threw away about halfway through the movie. I also wondered at the cut content because it seemed like there was a lot of half jokes or kind of setups for gags or side stories that never completed. I'm assuming this all ended up on the cutting room floor, but I'm sure one of the bigger YouTubers will cut touch on that with specific examples, but I'm guessing that it was due to backlash over the joking and lighter tones in the MCU movies in general such as Thor 4. Thor 4? Was it Thor 4? Thor 4, more 4, Thor. Iman Vellani is probably the most adorable MCU personality, and I love that it's her taking the initiative to form the Young Avengers, and that she's using the tablet she found under her couch to find the members. It's awesome and hilarious. Uh, putting the remaining scrolls on Earth would definitely play in favor of my idea for the Thunderbolts, though, and the next cat movie, so stay tuned for that. The next, next video is going to cover the main problem I think the MCU is experiencing and how I would overcome it if I were Lord Mayor of everything. Anyway, that's all I got for you.